It was referred to in the medical text in the Edwin Smith papyrus and in the Ebers papyrus. And this medical test was ascribed to Amin Hotum. Now, the evidence was confirmed when um, a mummy was discovered and excavated in a, near the Fela temple in Aswan. And as you look here, it shows a typical punched out lesion of gout. So they recognized it and they treated it with herbal medicines that contained colchicine. It's known as disease of kings. Do you know who is this king? Henry VIII, King of England. What is he famous of? He was very fat, he was an alcoholic, he used to binge drink, and he used to eat a lot of meat. Henry VIII had gout. Not only that, he had six wives. How come? He go with Sitta? Zay. He was a Catholic, so he could only marry one. مش كلهم مش كلهم فهو راح للبابا في الفاتيكان وقال له انا عايز ايه اطلق الست دي قال له ما ينفعش قال له خلاص انا هعمل الكنيسه بتاعتي راح انفصل وعمل الكنيسه الانجليزيه دي انجليكان تشيرش ان هي ديفورس ذا فيرست وايف سو وان از ديفورس ذن بيهيدد دايت اند ديفورس بيهيدد سرفايف طلق اثنين وطير راس اثنين واحده ماتت في اسمته والأخيرة سرفايد هو مات وهي عاشت. Right, let's talk about gout. Now it's simply deposition of monosodium urate crystals in the joints and tissues. And it's the result of increased serum uric acid above a specific level. Many people have hyperuricemia and are asymptomatic. And only about 5% of people with hyperuricemia above 9 mg per deciliter develop gout. مش كل واحد عنده هاي سيرم يوريك أسيد needs treatment. مش كل واحد عنده high serum uric acid عنده gout. This is a very important thing. مش كل واحد عنده chronic plantar fasciitis عنده gout أو عنده hyperuricemia. Genetic factors could play into it and enzymatic uh, deficiencies or uh, problems has a play into it. Now let's look simply at the uric acid metabolism. Where does it come from? From the breakdown of purines. Where are purines found? In nuclei. أي خلية أي لها نيوكليس فيها دي إن إيه وار إن إيه فيها بيورينز لما الخلية دي بتتكسر في النورمال تين أوفر أوف سيلز إن ذا بودي بتطلع بيورينز البيورينز دول بيبقوا ميتابولايزد إنتو يوريك أسيد أو يوريتس أي أكل ما فيهوش خلايا does not produce purines and does not produce uric acid فـ how is hyperuricemia how does it occur either overproduction of, pure, of uh, uric acid or under excretion because it's excreted in the guts and in the kidney. If there is hyperuricemia, remember it could be asymptomatic, you could have acute or chronic gout or you could have renal manifestations in the form of uh, renal stones and chronic kidney disease. Now let's look at that. What, how does, is it overproduced? Either you eat too much of it, like meat, Beef, pork, lamb, seafood, shrimps, tuna, mackerel, anchovies. Uh, you drink a lot of beer, which contains yeast, and the yeast has got a cell, and the cell has got a nucleus, and hence it produces purines. Also, alcohol decreases the re reabsorption of uh, urates, of, of uh, excretion of urates, so it accumulates in the blood. Now, if you have a malignancy or have a hematological disorder with a breakdown of cells, this produces excessive purines. If you're giving chemotherapy, the cells are broken down, it produces purines and produces uric acid. Enzymatic deficiencies, glycogen storage disease, the risk factors of males, old in age, and obese. Alcohol, hypertension, diabetes has a role into it. As regards urinary excretion, there are some diuretics that will lead to hyperuricemia. Renal failure will lead to increased uric acid. Alcohol will, will increase urinary reabsorption into the tubules and increase the uric acid. And this hyperuricemia, again, remember it is excreted in the gut and in the kidney. If problem with the kidney, the serum uric acid will increase. So it could be asymptomatic, you can have an acute attack, a chronic 
gout arthritis, or you can have kidney disease with renal stones. Now let's look at that. How does the acute attack start? The uh, urate crystals become deposited into the joint, and uh, it leads to an acute inflammatory reaction. How does this happen? The complex is activated. The crystals are engulfed by uh, monocytes and neutrophils, and inflammatory mediators are, re uh, <coughs> are released, which lead to tissue injury and inflammation. How does it present? Usually affects the first metatarsophalangeal joint. It begins abruptly and reaches a maximum within 8 to 12 hours. The affected joints are red, hot, swollen, and tender. So it could confuse, it could confuse you with infections. If untreated, it usually resolves in two weeks or less. It could also affect the kidney, the ankle, the fingers, and the wrist. But commonly, especially in acute attacks, it affects the first metatarsophalangeal joints. And I think we've all seen uh, cases like that in our practice. Diagnosis, the criteria, an old male, previous attacks, onset within one day, as you can see, it can escalate within 12 hours. A joint is red and swollen, usually first metatarsophalangeal joint involvement, hypertension or uh, cardiovascular disease, and a serumuric acid higher than seven in males and six in females. Now remember that not every acute gouty attack will have a high serumuric acid. So it could be normal and it could be high. But if it could be high, don't depend on it because it could be an infection. So you have to exclude infection. How are you going to do that? Get a sample of the joint fluid, send it to the lab, and they will recognize the, uh, the needle-shaped crystals of urates. So aspiration is important to recognize, uh, identify the crystals, do a gram stain and exclude the presence of bacteria, uh, do a white blood count on the fluid in the joint. It's usually between 10,000 to 70,000. Um, if it's more than 100,000, most probably it's infection. And in addition, you do cultural sensitivity of any fluid you remove from the joint. Treatment of acute attacks based on non-steroidals, either non-selective or selective uh, COX inhibitors. If it does not respond or there's a contraindication, you can use colchicine, but remember colchicine could lead to diarrhea. So you use it cautiously with increasing uh, doses. It does respond to systemic or intra-articular steroid injections, but again, you have to exclude infection. It's very important. The important thing, never use a urate-lowering drug in the acute attack. If you do that, you will prolong the attack, and it could precipitate another attack. So you have to control the acute attack with at least six weeks of non-steroidals, then you introduce the urate-lowering drug if indicated, and you continue a low dose of a non-steroidal and anti-inflammatory medication for approximately six months to overlap with the urate-lowering drugs. Dietary modification is easy and important. Avoid uh, eating a lot of meat, veal, turkey, pork, kebab or awanas, liver and kidney, seafood that we all love, alcohol that we don't have a problem with because it's, uh, we don't drink it. Reduce the weight is very important and avoid diuretics, especially the ones that will induce hyperuricemia. What's good if you have gout? Low fat dairy products like milk, cheese, yogurt, rice, eggs, nuts, and fruits and vegetables high in vitamin C, because vitamin C has a uricosuric effect. And these are the good foods that, the good, uh, foods that you can eat if you have gout. Now then we come to the famous urinary lowering, uh, the urate lowering medications. Uh, there are different groups and we'll discuss them now, but what's the indication? If you have two attacks or more of acute gout, if you have a serum uric acid more than nine milligrams, if you have one tophus or more, and if you have chronic gout arthritis. Now we come to the chronic gout, how does it present? The urate crystals deposit in the joint and leads to destruction and into the soft tissues in the form of uh, a tophus. You can see it in the air pin on the electronium process, in the fingers, in the joints, and around the foot and ankle. And it's a very easy clinical diagnosis. Now, when it does deposit in the joint, it leads to uh, punched-out lesions with sclerotic margins, cartilage destruction, and chronic synovitis. And you can see the synovitis here. Can you see the swelling 
and you can see the deposition of the uh, tophus. The, uh, this shadow is because of the deposition of the tophus and the cal urate crystals. Again, you can see it in the fingers, the chronic gout, and you can see the shiny tophus underneath the skin. It is affecting the joint, destroying it. Again, typical punched out lesions in the x-rays. Urate lowering drugs, we all use them, we all prescribe them. The first line of treatment should be allopurinol or the uh, febroxitat. If it doesn't work, then you have a probin seed, which is a urocosylic drug, which increases the excretion of, urine, of urates in the urine. However, you must be careful because it could induce renal stones if the urate excretion in 24 hours is more than 800 milligrams. Now, at last but not least, there's a new drug which is not available in Egypt, and that will convert, it's a uricase, a recombination uricase uh, enzyme, and that will convert the uric acid into allantoin, and hence will decrease the uh, serum uric acid. Now, let's move to calcium, calcium pyrophosphate uh, crystal deposition disease. As the gout was due to deposition of urate crystals, this is due to deposition of uh, calcium pyrophosphate in the joints and in connective tissues. Again, it could be asymptomatic, but if it uh, may, uh, results in symptoms, it could result in an acute inflammation of the joint or a chronic inflammatory degenerative arthropathy. Now, let's look at the presentations. The factors that are associated with uh, pyrophosphate arthropathy is hemochromatosis, hyperparathyroidism, hypo, hypothyroidism, and hypomagnesemia. How does it present? Acute attacks of pseudogout, or chondrocalcinosis, or a pyrophosphate arthropathy. Now let's look what, how are they different to gout? Actually, acute attacks are still very similar to gout, and they are due to deposition of the crystals in the joint. They lead to synovitis, and it's actually called pseudogout. However, um, as gout, affects the first metatarsophalangeal joint. In 50% of cases, the pseudogout affects the knee. It could affect the wrists, shoulder, ankles, feet, and elbows. But the knee is affected in 50% of cases. How are you going to diagnose it? Very important to aspirate the joint, exclude infection, identify rhomboid-shaped uh, calcium pyrophosphate crystals, and if you do an X-ray and you find chondrocalcinosis, that does help. Again, you have to exclude infection. Treatment is simple, a good dose of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. It does respond to systemic and intra-articular steroids, however, you've got to uh, exclude infection and low dose colchicine if it doesn't respond to non-steroidals. Chondrocalcinosis, this is a radiological finding due to deposition of the calcium pyrophosphate in the hyaline cartilage or the fibrocartilage in the joints. It is commonly associated in patients with a crystal pyrophosphate, uh, calcium pyrophosphate crystal deposition disease, but it could be asymptomatic. It could be just radiological finding. Let's look what it looks like. This is an X-ray of the wrist, and you can see it's deposited in the triangular fibrocartilage. This is an X-ray of the knee, and it's deposited in the hyaline and the menisci. And this is an arthroscopic picture of calcium deposition on the meniscus. Again, remember, it could be asymptomatic. Now let's talk about the chronic ones. In the chronic calcium pyrophosphate inflammatory arthritis, there is one entity that resembles rheumatoid arthritis with morning stiffness, fatigue, swelling, restricted joint movements due to inflammation or flexion contractures. It could involve multiple joints. It could be symmetrical, peripheral joints of the upper and lower limbs, wrists, knees and elbows. It could last for several months and is associated with remissions and exacerbations. How is it differentiated uh, between rheumatoid arthritis and this arthropathy? In this one, the remissions and exacerbations uh, could uh, affect one joint and not the other. I mean, if you have symmetrical arthritis, this knee could start uh, going into remission, and this one doesn't. However, in rheumatoid arthritis, all the joints go into remission, or all the joints go into an exacerbation. There is one other entity is associated with osteoarthritis. And approximately 50% of patients with symptomatic crystal uh, pyrophosphate uh, arthropathy with osteoarthritis does progress to joint degeneration. This affects the knee, the wrists, the fingers, hips, shoulders, elbows, and spine. 
And 50% of these patients will get, on top of that, acute episodes of pseudogout. Let's look at that. That's, an, that's a classic example. Chondrocalcinosis, osteoarthritis. So this is osteoarthritis associated with calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. A rare entity is severe uh, joint degeneration. And this actually will mimic uh, uh, neuropathic joints. And it's actually called pseudoneuropathic joint disease. And this is a very rare entity, and you'll hardly come across it. Now let's move to the shoulder. It's another entity. Calcium is involved, but in the form of uh, hydroxyapatite crystals. What happens in the shoulder? You get a painful condition of unknown etiology. Uh, calcium, uh, calcium hydroapatite crystals are deposited inside the tendon. However, they could leak into the subacromial bursa. They commonly affect the supraspinatus tendon followed by the infraspinatus tendon. It presents with severe pain, localized uh, redness and swelling of the shoulder, and it could be mistaken for infection. What does it look like? An amorphous deposition of calcium in the tendon. It's not in the subacromial bursa, it's inside the tendon. If you do an ultrasound, you'll see that uh, shows very obviously the supraspinatus tendon. That's the calcific, that's the um, hydro calcium hydroapatite deposition, and you can see it's throwing a shadow, a black shadow, and this is characteristic of uh, calcium uh, deposits in the tendons. Now, how are we going to treat it? Again, the first line is a good dose of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. If it does not respond and the uh, deposits are immature, you can do percutaneous uh, irrigation and remove them. However, in the majority of the cases, if it does not respond, you would need to do an ultrasound-guided uh, needling in which you will inject the subacromial bursa with steroids and a local anesthetic, followed by needling of the calcific deposits. And they, this gives the same results as arthroscopic removal. If you look at that, that was introduced by uh, ultrasound-guided. It's in the, in the tendon, not in the subacromial bursa. And with needling, these deposits can be removed, and it leads to remarkable improvement. So in summary, if you're looking at gout, diagnosis is very important, classic clinical picture, identification of the crystals in the synovial fluid. However, you have to exclude infection and never inject steroids without excluding infection in the joint. Avoid the urate-lowering drugs like allopurinol during the acute attack. It does respond to intraarticular steroids. However, infection has to be excluded. Many people who are hyperuricemic are asymptomatic. In chronic cases, you don't have to take the burden of treating the patient medically, just send him to a colleague rheumatologist for medical treatment. Chondrocalcinosis, it's a radiological finding that could be asymptomatic. Attacks of pseudogout and gout are very similar in the clinical presentation, hence differentiation depends on identification of the relevant crystals. Remember, in the shoulder, calcific tendinosity is a different pathology and presentation. It's deposited in the tendon and not in the joint. And if it doesn't respond to non-steroidal inflammatories, the ultrasound-guided needling is a very good option. Thank you very much.